Hello and welcome to another video by Deck Gun Development. I am just doing kind of a live spitball on this one, but I'm kind of practicing and getting some ideas together for a um, well for a brown bag for Lander School. So initially, I'm kind of getting some thoughts and general ideas. Initially, I was thinking maybe one about like CPUs and the general uh, system organization. Uh, I was also thinking about algorithms and merge sort and explaining like big O notation and how the time um, usage and stuff works for that and breaking it down. Uh, another thing I was thinking about was literally doing a basic sort of HTML CSS thing, but then I was like, well, I need to keep it engaging enough to interest people, but I also need to make it simple enough for people to actually understand. Uh, I think the algorithms one may be a little bit too dry for some people, and since it's going sort of over the whole of all like all the different cohorts, uh, there'll be some people who don't have any form of CS knowledge at all. So this would be more ideally to introduce them to CS rather than kind of scare them away from it. So I'm going to sort of do a quick brainstorm of uh, brain bags. Let's, let's share my uh, tablet. Uh, let's add my tablet to the thing anyway, I suppose. Let's join the meeting. Okay. Again, this is kind of like a live sort of idea session, so. Get ready for plenty of mistakes. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> no. But anyway, there we go. We've got that joining that. I'll stop sharing uh, this one. And uh, we'll start sharing my brainstorming section, I suppose, really. There we go. Uh, probably made this full screen so it's a bit simpler to deal with. Right, so sorry, I just had to mute the uh, tablet's microphone, otherwise that could get really confusing. Okay, so so we've got brown bag in the middle, and then we've got things like CS, CS objects like algorithms. We've got subjects like hardware. I'm right. <laughs> uh, let's see, under hardware we may have like CPU, oh, well, actually sysorg. Under sysorg you'd have like CPU, mem, IO. Uh, let's see what else could we do. Hmm, programming. Languages. Um, paradigms. Can you spell paradigms for some reason? Uh, let's see. See now that those are kind of be interchangeable to an extent and within each other because languages will be several paradigms or several languages may be on one paradigm. Technology. So showcasing certain tech. That may be frameworks that may actually sort of abstractly go into both all of these subjects to be honest. Depending upon how it goes. So, 
question being what is going to be a useful way of actually abstracting this. Let's get to here and get some different colored stuff to, maybe I'll just do that for highlighting. So from here, this is my main area of subject really on a personal level. This ties into it, but in general is that. I think this may be a little bit too dry for people. This as an overall subject may actually be interesting because we could actually tie into sort of like assembly language or something else in that or C, which actually then goes to the whole language thing. So yeah, I've got some notes for all of these different things if I go over here. Uh, let's have a look. So, no, no. Seriously. No, no, let's have a look down there. I've got a lot of sections in between. No, this is about making a game. It's an idea of some programming side of it, I suppose. Let's go through these. This is about explaining about the C compiler. It's another option. Then we have my system organization notes. Now, here's where basically the, it would be an explanation about the system organization. You've got CPU, you've got memory, and you've got the IO devices, which are all linked via the system bus. Now, the system bus actually contains uh, several different things, but we're just going to keep that abstract. purely because there's the uh, control bus, there's the data bus, there's a few other bits and pieces in there. So I'm just gonna just call all that accommodated as a system bus. Then we'd move on to talking about the CPU, the fact that it's abstract uh, block diagram would say it's a control unit, it's got the execution unit, it's got registers and it's got flags. Now, then I made notes to say the control units it retrieves and decodes instructions. It also retrieves and stores data in memory. That's what use the control unit is for. Now the execution unit, back up here, execution unit. That actually is the actual execution of the instructions. That's what that deals with. Then the registers, they're literally uh, internal memory addresses inside the CPU as such which um, are used to, for variables and such like, and general memory locations, and pointers to other memory locations. Flags, they're used to indicate various events when execution is happening. Uh, an example of a flag would be the zero flag. Oops, that's very strange. So, uh, would be the zero flag, which basically indicates true when a return value is zero. Now, on to a bit more of a breakdown of CPU registers would happen then. So we talk about the general purpose registers. Uh, there are usually, uh, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing here. We'll, we'll pretend this is a 32-bit uh, CPU. And that there are uh, there are usually about eight general purpose registers in a 32-bit CPU. Things like, uh, we're talking like Intel based, so x86 sort of thing. So we're looking at EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. Then we've got ESI, EDI, ESP and EBP. Now that's a stack pointer and a stack based pointer. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about these individually as we go. Then we've got things like the segment registers, which we'll talk about later. CS, DS, SS, ES, FS, and GS, which are six segment registers. That's for memory segmentation and things like that. Then we have a really important register here. It's the instruction pointer register. That are probably going to be more in depth as the course of this uh, talk goes. And then you've got the control registers, which we'll kind of hit on later to do with stuff. So we go over the general purpose registers next. It would be a case of EAX is the actual classical accumulator register. It's used for storing operands and result data from certain calculations and things like that. Basically, return values most of the time. Uh, the 
EBX is the base register. It's to give you a pointer to some data. Usually it's, it's the pointer of the thing to the data that's going to be, say, having an operation done to it, and then the return value goes to the EAX register. Then we've got the ECX, which is basically a counter register, usually used for looping operations, so to keep track of what iteration you're on and such. Again, these are all general purpose, so they can actually be interchanged. It's just this is their general use case, what their specs decide upon to start with. Then you've got the EDX, which is a data register. Usually this, is, this points to input-output device addresses. So literally it, it points to, say, the keyboard when you set certain data ports to certain things. This is where it gets the data ports and information. Then we've got the actual data pointer registers. This is usually for copying or, or doing memory operations. So you've got ESI, which is a source pointer, EDI, which is the destination pointer. Then moving on to the stack pointer. This basically shows you where the top of the stack is at any point in time. So basically this in accumulation with this equals how things are happening on the stack, like when you're pushing and popping, but we'll, we'll get onto that. So general purpose registers, when we're addressing general purpose registers in a 32 bit CPU, usually you look at them as EAX, EBX, ECX and EDX, for instance. That means that you've got like 32 bits of space to work with. Now, you can actually address them in 16-bit mode. So you can just look at the, fir the um, first 16 bits and it's referred to as AX, for instance, if it's EAX and BX if it was EBX and CX and so on. Then you can also now break that down into the two 8-bit representations which is AL and AH or BL and BH or CL and CH and so on all for their, their respective uh, for general purpose registers there so we can address them in that way then I was going to move on to memory so and look at the virtual memory model basically in the virtual memory model every process is laid out in the same virtual memory space regardless of its actual physical location. So it thinks it's literally the only thing that exists on the system, each process does. It doesn't know the outer underlying memory and physical stuff. It just knows that it's on its own and there's nothing else anywhere else. So literally every process feels that it's in the system alone um, and that it, has, that it has access to all the memory and that no other process exists at all. Now, to, to get this to work, the operating system and the CPU help to maintain this abstraction and they kind of keep it in a separate thing. Now, let's have a look at how uh, this is actually modeled in memory. So, obviously, a nice diagram on a slide would be good about that. So, memory is kind of set up from... Um, a specific site. This changes depend upon the kernel and what security issues they have. Basically, this is old fashioned. This would be like uh, if it was Linux, it'd be kernel 2.4 and below. Um, so basically, it, there was no real randomization of memory back then. It wasn't a normal thing. In, in kernel 2.6, this changes, but we're gonna kind of try and go with the simplest so that we can kind of see where it is and how it's working in a, in a general form. This, again, has changed for security reasons over time. So the virtual memory model actually, without the security and without the randomization, all processes think that this is their memory space. This is it. They have the same numbers. Everything's in the same place. So beginning at um, 804, 8000 and pretty much ending in BFFF. You know what I mean? Um, we have the memory. Yeah. So the memory consists of the program code at its lowest memory address. Then we have the initialized data. 
Then we've got the uninitialized data. Then we've got the heap, which is dynamic memory, and that grows that way. So when we add more to the heap, that can grow that way. Well, usually the heap is a huge amount of memory compared to everything else. Anyway, that's, that's usually quite large. Then you've got the stack. Let's ignore that unused for this, just so at this precise moment. So the stack's used for storing function arguments and local variables. Now this actually grows that way. So you see all this unused memory? This grows into that unused memory. And obviously if you overflowed it too far, you'd end up in the heap, for instance. Hence the whole stack overflow and so on and so forth. Or buffer overflow. And then the heap is dynamic memory. So when you malloc stuff, it gets put here. Uh, then you've got your uninitialized data, stuff that hasn't actually got settings yet. It's just like, say, I. So let's say you've gone int I or let I or whatever language you want to use. That would be uninitialized data. But then if you have let B equal 7, that will be within the data segment because that will be initialized data. It's got some sort of data to it. Yeah. Then, again, the program code is the actual executable code which we use. So... Imagining you were doing a buffer overflow, you, if you were able to understand the actual address, how far away we are from the actual executable code, you could then make the executable code do something by changing it. You could overwrite it. If you started putting um, data into the stack and keep putting data onto the stack until eventually it hits the text area, which is supposed to be read-only code, by the way. That's one other thing, but if you're low enough level, you can actually sort of circumvent that. So there's, there's ways around it, but we'll, we're not going into the whole security of things right now, really. Uh, this is more just an idea of the logical space and how it sees the memory. So if I move on. So the stack, stack's a LIFO or a FILO stack, which is basically last in, first out, or first in, last out. So it grows downwards, so you've got higher memory to lower memory. And your ESP is the pointer to where the stack, the end of the stack sort of thing. This is where the top of the stack is. I know it's technically going downwards, but that's what we call the top of the stack. Then when we, it has, um, it has two main operations that can be done on it, and that's push and pop. Uh, push pushes a value onto the stack. So if you've done a push operation, what would happen is it would add the data at the data point, which is where the stack current top is. So it just put it there. Then it would move the ESP to point to there. So now the top of the stack's there. Now a pop operation would literally do the opposite. Well, when I say the opposite, usually for optimization, all it does is it moves the ESP up here and leaves the data as it is, just for optimization. You could have it zero out that data and move to the top there. But usually all it does is it moves the pointer. So there, as far as it's concerned, anything beyond that doesn't exist. And then returns whatever that value was to the caller. Okay, so then, then I'd like to have done a live demo, which would be examining the actual memory, uh, looking at the stack and registers in like GDB, like a debugger. That's the GNU debugging tool. I'll do that sort of in a Linux disk drive, possibly on a virtual machine, I don't know. I'll have to make it so either it's got a 2.4 kernel or I've got to do some little settings to kind of say that I want it to ignore the randomization and turn that off in the proc file system. But that's, that's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but that's basically the way I'm thinking of doing it. So that's one option. Uh, let's see. The other option is a little bit more, um, I, I don't know about whether it's a bit more technical, but it's, it's a little bit more um, in depth, I think, because all this is doing, this is working out what the overall big O notation is for a merge sort recursion tree. So we worked out that the T of N is actually equal to 2T over N, uh, sorry, 2T, uh, 2T of N over 2 plus CN. Now C being constant, 
n being the actual uh, number of the actual iteration and t being time okay so this is based upon where c is greater than zero and it's to, uh, where c greater than zero is a constant that stays whether that's a one or a two or wherever else so the tree is cn which is our actual constant number and then it breaks down to t of n over 2 and t of n over 2. So if you get those two together, you end up with cm. And that's the breakdown for the first basics of the tree. Then it further breaks down to cn, down to cn over 2, then down to t of n over 4 for each of the leaves. This is all the workings to get to the big O notation, what we want to actually find out. So then if we went down the tree and down the tree and keep going down the tree until all of this goes and breaks down to do over four, over eight, over blah, blah, over this, over that, you eventually end up with constant time. So you end up literally a, a, t, a constant t. Or t of n depend upon the outlook, what you end up with. The, these are like best case to worst case. You can average those out, but that's that. Uh, so then the height of h is actually equal to one plus log of n. So if we look at the, depending on what the height of the actual thing is, if we look at this, it's actually seeing it as constant because c of n is actual c of n. But then c of n half uh, over two twice would be c of n. c of n four, four times would be c of n. So, so it's all coming down to constant time when we just do the actual remediation. So in accordance with this algorithm, C of n and C of n of 2, C of n over 4, and C of n over whatever is always going to be a constant time C of n. But because these are accumulative, we'll end up with actual O of n because it will constantly go down, but then these accumulate, therefore it will be O of n because it will be a number of iterations, one, two, three, and so on. So number of leaves is equal to n, which means the um, bigger notation is O of n. But if we take number of leaves equal to n and work based upon this divisibles set, we end up with uh, t equal to big O of n log n. So our total uh, so it equates to the total of that. So that's basically the total amount of work done at each level is n log m. Well, big O of n log, n log m. Then if we um, calculate all of the work done at all of the leaves by observing the tree and finding that 1 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25 plus blah, blah, going down and down and down, equate to less than 2 which then gives us a total time notation for all work done to O of n. So worst case, we've got O of n. At best case, we've got... Here we go. This also leads us to the conclusion that all work done point equates to O n squared. O of n squared, sorry. Which, again, you can simplify, uh, which I'll change the drawing a bit. Let's say... Simplified to big O of M. Now, so we're talking worst case, big O of M. I'd say probably best case, in fact, if we work to the actual calculation, best case of big, oops, how far could write? Big O of C, or we can note it as big O of 1, just constant time notation. And then the average would actually equate to big O of N log N. And this is where we would get our information for the time notation for the merge sort recursion tree. So basically for merge sort, we would extrapolate that the worst case scenario is big O of n. Best case scenario is constant time. 
and the average scenario is uh, n log n. So worst is linear time. Um, best is constant time and average is log logarithmic time. Oh, see. So basically here's our generalities and that is the big O notation for a merge sort. So that would be uh, an approximation of something that would um, be the um, talk of that. So I'm not too sure whether it's going to be better to do something like this or better to do the um, system organization. So, so there is, there's a lot of uh, remediation and thought to go over. I've made this sort of live based sort of um, talk about this of the planning so that I can put this and uh, and let people have a look over this and see if they've got uh, any input as to what would be the best idea for the planning side of this and whether it would be good to go forward with the um, big O notation side of things and the algorithms or whether it would be good to go over the system organization. Now again, uh, I haven't done the live demo for the system organization coding or any big O notation stuff. Uh, ideally, for the um, bigger notation stuff, there would still be um, then a live demo portion, which would probably just be me coding up a merge sort. So that's the other options. So, so basically that's my thoughts so far. Again, this is all open to discussion and open to deliberation and stuff. But that's my general planning ideas so far. There, there are other ideas along the way, but those are my two main ones that I was thinking to cover sort of computer science sort of structure and computer science uh, subjects. So all in all that being said, uh, I'll be open to um, questions or anything like that after anyone bothers watching this and stuff. And I'll see you guys in Slack.